Enshima PhD, actually from Brazil. And I'm gonna talk about this project that was developed here. Uh, starting to, it was started to develop here uh, last year with Jacopo, uh, with, who had a close correspondence with Mercedes Pascual, and then we started to study this model. And it's mainly about consumer resource models. So it's gonna be more or less like a follow-up of the tutorial that we had last week with some things new uh, on this kind of framework. So consumer resource models, so it was something that started in the 70s, in the late 60s by MacArthur, and it's a very well-known kind of system that, can, that tries to explain the, the ecological dynamics of a community that is uh, competing for the same resources. So the kind of interactions that you have between among species is due to competition for resources. So we start simply by, with a community. We have our microbes in this community. There are also some resources in the community. And you have these dynamics of the abundances of these microbes are changing due to the competitions for the, due to competition for the resources. And also the concentration of the resources are changing because of the depletion due to the consumption by the resources. There are many things that we already know about the systems. So this is a very r random set of uh, 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 references in the field, some very new references on that. But the fact about this kind of model is that they are always including this important thing that resources are limited and then richness is limited. So OK, I can say in many of these uh, results, they are saying that, OK, I'm going to say that the number of resources is infinite and the number of species is also infinite. But there's also this limitation of I cannot never overcome the competitive exclusion principle in these kinds of systems. But the inverse question is never posed. Like, what if the number of resources is not limited? So what would happen in a kind of system? So this is a kind of weird question but it can help us to try to understand different things. And these different things can range from something that comes from epidemiology. So we can look for pathogens that are very, that have many, many strains. And this is a problem for these pathogens because they are always escaping immunity. And we, can ha we have problems for developing vaccines and efficient treatments for this kind of pathogens. And in this paper by Mercedes, and here we have this, they, they, pro, they propose this diversification threshold, which is like a, repro, a basic reproduction number, but for diversity. So above this kind of threshold, that pathogen starts simply to accumulate many different strains, and then it's hard to treat. It's hard to uh, approach this problem. And, but we can also take a completely different approach for trying to understand why that question of unlimited number of resources can be important. So we can go for uh, the diversity in marine communities. So we see from fossil records that diversity in marine communities started to increase with an exponential growth in the beginning, but then it reached a stagnation phase. And try to understand why this stagnation phase appears in the fossil record is actually very controversial. So that's a, very, a question that you can try, OK, why these things are happening? So there is this accumulation of resources due to evolution in my system and why it's happening. So to try to uh, attack this problem, we propose this model. So it's an eco-evolutionary model, OK? And it's very based on the works by Good. So it's not based, but it uh, reminds a lot their model, OK, with some differences. But the things go like this. We're going to start with a consumer resource model on a chemostat. So we're going to have our microbes in this chemostat. And there is this constant supply of resources. And the number of resources that I can have in my system is unlimited. So I simply have a set of microbes. They have their genes. They can consume the resources that are there. But if appears a new microbe that are able to metabolize a new resource, OK, there is a new resource for you. That's what you're saying uh, with an unlimited number of resources in the system. 
And we have our strategy matrix that for some reason I called it consumption matrix. I think the reason is that because it's only one and zero, so it's exactly what I'm consuming or not consuming, okay? So in the next step, we are gonna evolve this ecological dynamics through a, a set of equations. I'm gonna talk about the equations. And after that, after it reaches an equilibrium, I include a mutant in my system. And then this set of, uh, I run again the, these equations, these ecological dynamics, and the equilibrium of my system changes, the abundances can change, and this new mutant, as you can see, it's like a new line as a new column in the strategy matrix, and then a new mutant tries to invade the system again, and I'm always just doing the cycle. I include a mutant, I run the system up to equilibrium, and then include a new mutant, and here we go. Yes? So is there some sort of constraint on the total amount of resources that you can have as many different kinds as you want, but it's not like every time you add a new kind, you also sort of have, have increased the amount of matter now? Yes, there is a one constraint, I'm gonna talk about it, that it appears very naturally, that this question is very natural in the system, and yes, the, there's gonna be one, okay? Or not, you can include or not, but yes. You, you can constrain or not, but, but it appears very naturally, yeah. So in this model, the fact that we have infinite resources means that every new mutant that you insert can technically produce a new resource that other species can use? That's a good question. It can, but it's not necessarily goes because we have different types of mutation that can appear okay. in the system. So you can have pure fitness mutations, so my new microbe is gonna simply change the fitness uh, in respect to its ancestor. My new microbe can simply acquire a gene by horizontal gene transfer that was already there in the pool of genes in this population, or it can be a de novo mutation, which means that it's simply acquiring a gene that was not present before. So this microbe's able to consume something new, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, what you're saying is that you can produce new resources that were not in the basic... Uh, the, the resource was already there. That, that's the hypothesis. Yes, the so resource is already there. I just cannot see. There's no gene for metabolizing ah. it. That's the idea. So mutations are able to uh, give you the, uh, the ability of metabolizing a new gene, a new resource. That's the idea. Okay. So going to the equations now. So it's a simple consumer dynamics, resource, uh, consumer dynamics model. So we have our equation for the consumers. So that A over there is my strategy matrix, okay? It's a linear consumption of the resource concentration. Uh, and there's also uh, the log fitness factor there. So that exponential accounts for fitness, and it's a global fitness. Fitness here is not directed to the consumption of a given resource. It could be a modification in the model. And when you look to the dynamics, the resources, we have this constant inflow of resources, eight I for every resource I, and we also have the degradation rate or the depletion, the dilution, that's the thing that's washing out the resources from my, from my chemostat, okay? There's also this metabolic trade-off, so the number of resources that a species is consuming is constant, okay? We are not changing the number of consumed resources. So at the moment that I acquire a new resource to consume, it means that I lose one. Yes, it's always constant, okay? So I could, of course, relax this thing and put some, the, the trade-off as a death rate or anything else. There are many ways of doing this, okay? And... I, I'm, I'm confused about this rule because you were saying the resources were always there, just yes. passively lying in a chemostat with nobody to utilize. Why? Uh, ability to consume a new resource means that one of the old ones have to go. Has to go. I mean, it's you're just, kind of not ch you are sub changing the supply to give us that because that's the only way a resource no, I, can I, disappear. Yeah, it's like it's just too cost. Uh, the, the cost for me to consume in many different resources is too high. Oh, oh, I see. It's not yes. lost from the chemist. No, it's, it's lost, lost for my machinery. Chemist, yes, one. yes. Otherwise, I think that the. I think that the, the evolution will say will, will give you strains that consumes everything because it's more efficient. Also, yes. Don't, if I don't like to discuss, 
so these uh, Y sigmas, they're um, randomly drawn, and it's the same for every species, or? Okay, so I start, I'm going to start the system with a, uh, a community that has always uh, no fitness difference. So everyone has, in, in terms of fitness, they, everyone has the same ability of consuming the resources. But then because of mutations of fitness, so this thing can acquire a just a small uh, difference. It could be higher or lower than its ancestor. And it's just acquired from a, a, a normal distribution, okay? That it has the center on its ancestor and just a small uh, deviation, okay? So to treat these equations, what you're gonna do is simply to, we're always interested in looking to the equilibrium of these equations so we can do some stuff. And the first thing that you can do is just change time scales. We say that the consumer dynamics is too fast. It's very, very fast. So we can just set the second equation to zero. And then we include our uh, result in the previous one. Okay? And then we have this final equation. That's the equation we're going to look. Okay? We're going to treat this equation here. So, and then our question is, and the long time limit I mean, after I include many, many mutants in my system, what's going to happen with the number of uh, mu uh, species, the strains that I have in my system? Or also, what's going to happen with the number of active resources in my system? I mean, those resources that are really being consumed by a given species. So it's, is this something that's going to reach some limit? Is this something that's going to explode? So that, that's the question that you're trying to answer now. Okay? So, we have some analytical results on that equation. Okay, so the first thing is something about uniqueness and coexistence of the, the solutions of that equation. The important thing here is that it can, if I change, if I use that product there, the delta, which is the death rate of my uh, uh, species, of my strains, times the exponential of minus the log fitness then if that guy is different for everyone, then I can have a unique solution, and my system is never going to overcome uh, the competitive exclusion principle. But why do I want that? It's just because it's not dependent on initial conditions. So I can really run simulations, and all the variability that I had at the end is not due to different initial conditions. It's due to my sto the natural stochasticity that I'm using for the mutations. Okay? So just to talk a bit about the math behind this thing, it's nothing hard. We have a Lyapunov function for this system, so we can show that it has this convex function, that it's always decreasing over time, over the dynamics. It's going to find a minimum. The only thing I need to try to show is that this minimum is not the generator for my solutions. That's the only thing. And I can al always do that thing if I have my strategies are linearly independent, if I am going to have some, uh, the, max, the number of species, it, then it's uh, for sure not true if I have more species than a resource. Okay? And the second part of this thing, how to prove this non-degeneracy, we're going to look to the linear equations that can simply come from my system of equations. I simply do use these tricks of finding new things. There's a minus missing there and the exponent of the log fitness. Uh, we just analyzed these things. It's something very, uh, just pure linear algebra here, okay? So then, as I mentioned, that's the important part. So we always try to treat that thing as something's different, just do for a simulation uh, perspective. And there's also something different that you can prove that's quite trivial, but it, it's important for us, again, thinking about simulations, that I can only miss resources in the sense that there's a set of species that are consuming resources in my system, and these species can go, all go extinct, so I'm going to lose the gene for metabolizing that resource. It can only happen if I have a dilution rate of my chemostat that is non-zero. It's sort of kind of trivial. I'm saying that if I'm never washing out things, my resources from my, uh, from my chemostat, they are always remaining there, so why am I going to lose it? But that's a, a, a result that can make it formal. And the math behind this thing is just to disconsider all the other resources that a string is consuming, because they are always adding something new to you. And you're just going to say that that resource is 
going to be consumed by a single string and you prove that the rate of change is positive. That's it. So if you want to go to negative change and negative rate of change, you need to pass for a zero. So you're going to stop the evolution there. Okay? You can, you can lost resource from the system. That's, that's the only way you can lost. I'm not saying that you, you will lost, but you can. Then in the simulations, we see that we lost. Okay? So just to summarize these two things, so from the uniqueness and coexistence theorem, we're going to always try to work with death rates different for everyone. We're just going to draw the ref death rates uh, from our normal distribution. It looks kind of many people who are working in the system say, okay, but we're always doing these things, abstracting things from random distributions, and what's the new here, the, the novelty here? The, the thing is that, okay, I'm trying to find uh, the most simple system to simulate, and now I'm just saying that, no, you cannot look for the most simple one. You need to make some stuff random there, okay? The second thing, again, is choosing a value for the dilution rate, so it cannot be zero again. So the simplest case would be just choose it zero, but no, we cannot choose it zero. We need to put some value if you want to check for different responses of my system, okay? Uh, there's another result that we can do here. It's just a, a sufficient condition for invasion of a new resource. So if your new resource quality, the inflow of this new resource is greater than a given threshold for that species, it's going to invade. That's it. So, and this has, to prove this thing, it's also not hard. We also neglect things that are not, uh, the, the other resources are only focused on these things for the evolution. We can show some stuff again that it can be positive if that exactly condition is satisfied. But the important thing of that equation is that it leads to this important result on the evolution of the system that says that if I have fitness evolution, I can always increase the number of species in my system. That's the important result here. So just to see that in the previous equation, we just see that the, the log fitness there, so if I increase the log fitness, the resource quality can decrease as much as you want. So you just need to have a high fitness to be able to the next to a random resource invader system. You just need to give it time enough. Just that. Okay. So let's go to the computational results to see. And here comes your question. So the fact is that if you just look to the equilibrium of those equa that equation, we can see that the carrying capacity of my system can increase with the, inf with the number of resources that have an inflow. So if this thing is just an open thing, I just, uh, as soon as I find a new resource to consume, the current capacity of my system increases, so I can expect that I am always increasing the richness of my system now, because everyone is able to increase their abundance once the current capacity is higher. So, uh, question? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna divide our simulations in two cases. So the first case, we're not gonna fix the current capacity. So the sum of the inflows of the active resources is not fixed. As soon as I discover a new resource, I'm simply, uh, I let it invade the system, I let it to be there, so the richness can increase. But I can also fix that guy, so I can renormalize. As soon as a new resource appears, I just renormalize all the inflow rates in a way that's always fixed. I have my, crit my critics to that, but uh, we're gonna reach there. So this is the result for in the case that we don't have a fixed energy. So what we see is that when I don't have energy conservation, so that sigma y here is just the how much the fitness mutations are changing when you have a fitness mutation, how much they are changing fitness. So what you see is that even in the neutral case where I don't have fitness mutations, the richness is able to increase. So in this case, I there's a de novo mutant, so it's carrying a new gene in the system, and it's able to be there. But even so, I'm losing resources there. So it's not that the invasion of a new mutant is doing nothing in the system. It's doing something. It's shaking the equilibrium of my system. I'm losing things, but at the end, the richness is increasing. Okay? But now, if I use the trick of saying that the energy of 
the, the system, like the, the sum of all the inflow rates is a constant, then something, uh, a few things, a few different things can happen. So to start with, in the neutral case, now there's a limiting. That there's a limit in the number of resources that can invade my system. And the second thing is that, okay, now I have fitness evolution. As expected, fitness evolution is always overcome effects of degradation, is always overcome the effects of dilution. And then I can see the, the resources accumulating in the system as also the number of strains are accumulating in the system, but now in a linear way. So it's much slower than before. And we can see actually this value on the number of resources. So we just use that lemma that we had for invasion. Uh, using that, you can find the maximum number of resources that my system would acquire, and it really matched the simulations when you had the, the, the neutral case. For the other cases, then you need to do this balance of all the mutation rates to try to see at which rate I'm actually including new resources, and then you could see what would be the maximum number of resources for that time. Okay. K, 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 K. K is the number of resources that a single species can consume. It's the metabolic trade-off parameter. Okay. So it's like I'm saying uh, in, in the equation below, I'm just saying that I'm using the sufficient condition for evasion for all the resources that I strain is consuming as if there was no competition for this resource. So that's why it appears a K multiply. Okay. And because I'm neglecting the competition, there's the, the result is approximate at the end. Okay. So, but I don't like this thing of limiting energy like this, limiting summing all the inflow rates and saying that it's a constant because it's something weird. The inflows were already there. I, I have my experiment. There is also, there's already an inflow of resources there. And then out of nowhere, uh, a mutant appears, and it changes everything. So it's like I am a, a, I'm the lab guy. I'm just watch. OK, there's a mutant. Let me change everything now. So it's not nice, this thing. It's really, but I can try to include this energy conservation in a different way. So the other way that you can do that is due to cross-feeding. So the energy is only appearing with one, uh, a given set of resources, and I am consuming these resources, metabolizing it, and what's appearing from that metabolism is actually my new resource. So I can do an infinite uh, chain, an infinite tree of these metabolites, and these are my resource, and the system conserves energy. It's gonna conserve all the inflow rates. Okay, actually, I am always limiting because the last guy, I'm not using that energy, okay? So to do that, the consumer dynamics just changes a bit because we just need to say, okay, it's not all the biomass that I'm consuming from my resource that's actually becoming my biomass. I need to consume a fraction L of that. And then for the consumer dynamics, I'm just saying, okay, I'm consuming that thing, but now there are some inflow of that uh, resource just coming from the metabolization of another resource. That's the last term in my equations. And it's a long, it, this is a general equation. There are many things we can, yes? Okay, so this is a long equation. We can just do many things here, uh, but we can simplify this thing. So we're gonna use a linear chain of resources. So I just have one resource being produced, uh, being converted in another resource. So I have my set of bugs there. They are consuming a resource. They are secreting the other resource and, and so on. When we do that, we just can, whoops, we just change our set of equations in a very simple way. And now we have the final equation is this very ugly thing. But the important thing about this ugly stuff is that that term there looks like an inflow rate exactly as the previous equation that we had. So if we kind of just Simplify this thing because this equation does not have all the properties that you had, all the analytical properties that you had calculated. So we just change things. We just say that our resources in this linear chain are exponentially decaying their quality, okay, through this uh, chain of consumers. And energy in this case is still limited. I just sum over all the infinite resources. I have a limited energy here. And in this case, we can show also a sufficient condition for evasion, and that's obese that equation. 
and then we can go to the simulations. And the simulations, something weird, because now we are just running the simulations and we're seeing that there's a limit in the number of uh, active resources, even if I have uh, fitness evolution. That was not what we had before. And the thing here is because when you're doing simulations, when you're doing computational stuff, you need to de decide what's the threshold for a zero. So what's a, a species that went extinction, went extinct in my system? So if we just use this constant threshold for extinction, then you find this result. It's exactly having that sufficient condition and including a constant threshold there. When you do that, we really find a maximum number of resources that can be acquired in my system, that can actually not be lost in my system. And that's there. That's exactly what you see. You change this threshold, and you actually change what's the number of resources that are there. But then, if I allow my extinction threshold to evolve, and I am I'm using all the equations to actually see what should be the evolution of the extinction threshold, and then we can simply see the accumulation of resources. Yeah, but in the real world, or at some point, there's one cell in your, okay. Yes. But so isn't the, yes. I, I thought you were gonna say, if you're not demanding a linear chain, but you allow sort of, let's say, more random graphs, then, the, the, then L is gonna be much less, right? There's gonna be less steps that you're down from the most abundant guy. So wouldn't that sort of give you many more? Yes, that's something that we, I, I want to do. I still want to do that. It just includes a very random graph, a very random tree, just to see what can happen there, to see what's the result. But I think that things would be slower, just that. Or maybe faster, because if I am acquiring resources that are on the top of the tree, now they, have a, they, they are having much more energy than in this case that they're always Harvesting a very low energy. Now you have blocks at each level L. Yes, you one can change. Guy, whereas then you would have exponentially many guys at level L, right? Because there are exponentially many trees. Yes, so yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, no, that's something to explore. That's something to explore, for sure. Just to, to go, I'm really reaching the end. So. Another thing that's quite interesting here is when you look to that sufficient condition for invasion, and that thing it depends on the species that is trying to invade my system, so it depends on its fitness. But if I just change that equation to the maximum fitness in my population, it really fits all the curves. So it's really like the highest fitness strain is the one that's driving all the invasions in my system. Um, other things that we can do, we can try to study in the cross-feeding system is to try to see how the system is fragile uh, uh, to random events in the environment. So I'm not gonna explain what it did here, but the fact is that I'm gonna have many species that are consuming only one resource. So if this species, a uh, random species simply disappear, the following resources in this cross-feeding chain are, are not gonna be produced. And then something can happen at the end. And when you see the simulation, is that really something is happening. So I'm now randomly extinct in a species. It's an environmental fluctuation. I simply start to see the number of active resources and species. They are simply more or less reaching something constant. This is still a work in progress. So there are many simulations just to confirm these results. But it's something that we already have in mind. Like it's really going to uh, acquire some equilibrium in the system. So just to sum up, just to finish this thing, to finish the story. So we start with the question, what if I have an unlimited number of resources in my system? And to approach this question, we use the, this consumer resource dynamics with an unlimited number of possible resources in my system. We find that uh, the evolution of fitness, the fitness evolution is always able to overcome degradation effects and bad quality reset. Uh, Effects. And then we separate our results into parts. So we're going to have the, the systems that have uh, a limited energy, those that don't have limited energy, the systems with no energy conservation, they are uh, always accumulating resources, even in the neutral case. Uh, but if I have uh, energy conservation, then we can see that the accumulation of resources is lower, and I am also, I can also have a different ways of conserving energy, like cross-feeding systems and cross-feeding 
systems, they really show us the problems of the simulation thresholds, how we do the simulations, how we perform the cinematical stuff. Uh, and they are very susceptible to random events so, uh, that are happening in the environment. And there's a very nice to-do list things here. We can, you can give ideas also. We can include dilution stuff here. That are many things everyone can. I don't know. Could put a box here. Or just put your ideas. This is. There are many things that we can still uh, research and investigate in this kind of system. But the take-home message is that in this kind of model, with its limitations, fitness evolution always allows diversity to increase. If you want to limit diversity in this kind of things, you really need to put some uh, uh, exogenous effect in my system, exogenous uh, actions in my system. So I just want to thank all the organizers, thank my funding institution, and thank STP for receiving me here, and thank you all. Right, uh, a, a very, very nice work. I'm just trying to put it in context of what I, what I know. So in this last model with cross-feeding, right, where you yes. have a cascade, yes. it looks very, very similar to what we did with Akshit Goyal in 2018. The only difference is that we fed the ecosystem with only one resource and let it cascade down. And we also saw this uh, increase in diversity as a function of time. So what is different in your model where you have, as far as I can tell, the main difference is that you feed it not with one resource, but with a certain number of resources in the beginning. And then everything else is generated through this cross-feeding cascades, like the new resources appear at the first, second, third trophic levels. Yeah, don't, don't, I think that the only thing that is changing here is what are the mutants doing? So if, if I have, a, mute, if I have a, a gene that's lost in my system, so all the, the, cask, the, the forward part of the cascade is going to disappear. And then what's the next mutant that is going to appear in my system? And here, I am sure that the next mutant, the novel one, is going to be the one that fits in that position just to reconstruct all this cascade. I see. That's, I see. Maybe and this is the only change. Got it. Got it. Um. These BKIs, right, they determine how much of each resource K each uh, strain, yes. or no, APK sigma, okay, I'm, I'm yeah. not, are producing. So can those evolve? Uh, in this equation, no, no, in this system, no. In this, uh, in this model, no. We are not but the idea is that there. some guy while he's eating, he's excreting something. For sure. For sure. And in that case, probably maybe this is also subject to evolution. And maybe this can then destabilize the thing because maybe you want to evolve these things to zero. No? For sure. For sure. Yes. If there, the, the fact is that I can change these things, uh, each one of them I can change. So, and they are always related to fitness mutations. It's just my efficiency in converting resources in one to another. It's my efficiency in harvesting resources that's always related to that. In this case, the fitness mutations are global. So if I simply, I can change, I can simply put uh, the fitness mutations directed to a given resource. So I'm going to change only the efficiency of consuming that specific resource. This is something that can be done. We discussed that, but we, we thought that it wouldn't lead to something new, actually. If we look only to, the, to this conversion rate, that can be something new, for sure, only to that, instead of just putting global fitness on efficiency, uh, different kinds of efficiency in harvesting the resource. But that's, again, the, the general result. So if I still allow this fitness to increase, I'm still going to allow a species to invade. So I need to have a mechanism to stop that. So for sure, if I simply get one of these conversion rates and set that to one or to zero, then I'm also changing how everything is happening there. And then for sure, that's, then that's what we're not looking. That that's if, what if you allow guys, somebody to evolve that eats everything and doesn't discrete anything else, then but, they can always push out everybody else, right? But, but that's exactly the, the question that we're trying to not find, the, the answer that we're trying to not find, because this is trivial. We're looking for something not trivial. 
And then at the end with the equations, we really show the triviality of this result. That's what we see. It's just that. One more quick question, and then we go to have a coffee break. So as a small uh, comment, uh, when you have uh, the same e to the y sigma for everybody, you yes. can just uh, rescale. And you have a consumer resource model with a slightly different death rate, delta sigma, e to the minus y yes. sigma. Yes. So since you have the same metabolic uh, trade-off as post phi, if the death rates are equal, uh, you have uh, more uh, consumers than resources in some cases. Yes, but at the end, what you're trying to see is only the equilibrium system, is only the equilibrium point. So when I'm changing time scales of the ecological dynamics, it's not changing actually the, times, the results that I'm seeing. No, no, because but it's just, like the time scale between two points. So. No, no, but just to say that when you say if we choose the same defrit for everybody, it's not yes, interesting yes. to us. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. There are no more questions now. If somebody wants to ask something, he can ask or she can ask on the coffee break. <laughs> All right. We meet here at uh, 11.05, right? Word of advice about For sure, please. This, uh, yes. Why is usually yield? Every oh, consumer okay. resource model really? I saw, why means yield. Okay. Don't use it for fitness and okay. the other things.